What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Denaric Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnia Reacts to Wonder Why the Holy Roman Empire Explained. Okay, so I did a video on Wonder Why quite a while back. It was regarding the breakup of Yugoslavia. So he is a Scottish YouTuber. You can tell from his accent, and uh, he's going to try to explain, I would say, the most complex political entity of all time, the Holy Roman Empire. Whatever you're looking at on the screen there is kind of what it was, yeah. A lot of times those statelets would be the size of a small town. Okay, I believe the smallest one was only the size of a few homesteads. It was like something crazy. Uh, but yeah, some of them you may have heard of, some of these small statelets, like the Bavaria, it was its own state at one point, uh, Brandenburg. Uh, they helped create Prussia, which created Germany. Uh, they're like right up there somewhere uh hamburg there were a few free cities such as hamburg was its own city uh but you can also see other non-german states in here uh, like you, you would even see silesia and uh, bohemia yeah Ch czech republic anybody that's what that knows you for would know a little bit about um the holy roman empire even though those are what did people think about this thing at the time <laughs> Because if something like this existed today, we would be like, what the? Imagine having a geography quiz on every capital of the Holy Roman Empire. Nah. -uh. But uh, anyway, this was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, and we're about to see how uh, Voltaire was indeed correct. The Holy Roman Empire was a large collection of thousands of political entities made up of different ethnicities that existed for more than a thousand years thousands. at the heart of Europe. Stretching from modern day Italy to Denmark, from France to Poland, the Holy Roman Empire was an important part of European history, with several countries that exist today having emerged from the empire. Keeping in line with the empire's complex nature, there isn't even a universally agreed upon date as to when the empire actually started. The two dates cited are 800 and 962 AD. Uh, so before this, um, it says coronation of Charlemagne right there, so... Uh, before this, uh, there was uh, Charlemagne, you know, who would have his Frankish kingdom, and it would be split up between his his three uh, brothers. One would have basically what we now know as France, one would, ha one would have basically what we now know as uh, Germany. The other third brother got screwed over and was given a small, thin strip of a state down through Central Europe and into the Alps, which made no sense whatsoever, and it got immediately corrupted. Uh, uh conquered by the other two and and it, one of those brothers would you know like have what was today Ger uh, france the other one had what was today germany uh, and it ended up becoming that for some reason <laughs> but um i'll get into the reason as to why i think it ended up becoming like this in a little after the fall of the western roman empire in the fifth century the roman empire was reduced to its eastern half of course their capital city was no longer rome it was the ethnically greek city of constantinople now, while the inhabitants of this empire continue to see themselves as, well, the Roman Empire, modern historians tend to refer to them as the Byzantine Empire, based on the old name for the capital city, Byzantium. Anyway, three centuries later, the Frankish like king Charlemagne was crowned Emperor of the then. Romans, as the Pope transferred the imperial title from east back to west. At the time, the title was considered vacant because it was held by a woman known simply as Irene, who killed her own son to take power from him. The Frankish kingdoms were split and reunited several times, with three kingdoms yeah, emerging that. that would make up <laughs> the core of the Holy Roman Empire, the German Kingdom, the Italian Kingdom and the Burgundian Kingdom. There was also the Kingdom of Bohemia, but that didn't become a kingdom until 1198. In 961, Otto I, King of Germany, came to the assistance of Pope John XII as the Papal States were invaded by Berenger II of Italy. Otto conquered northern Italy and deposed the Berenger as his own troops abandoned him. The Pope crowned Otto Emperor in 962, the first German to become Emperor. Almost all successors would be German for the rest of the Empire's existence. The Mostly early years of the Austria. Empire's history are dominated by its strained relations with the Papacy, a seemingly never-ending power struggle between various Emperors and Popes over the course of several centuries. They could never agree who was superior, Pope or Emperor. In the mid-13th century, why not the Empire had an interregnum in which no king was crowned emperor for 67 years. 
This would actually be the first of three interregnums, as another two times in the next century and a half would see long stretches of time without a crowned emperor. During the rule of Charles... Uh, the emperor really only had, like, n nominal powers at best. Uh, a lot of the times the little, small little statelets would just do their own thing. So, I'll get into the immediate uh, elephant in the room, uh, why so many states and statelets... Well, one is the lack of proper centralized power, which uh, France had. Now, it was a lot easier for France, because if we know France um, is, for the most part, one giant open flatland. It was much more easier to exert power from Paris into the uh, countryside. Now, Paris, can uh, economically and population-wise, was just so much larger than any other population into what we consider nowadays mainland France or metropolitan France. Even to this day, Paris is so much larger. So there's like really only one center of power, then maybe Lyon is pretty big, then maybe Marseille, you know. It was mostly just uh, Paris, which was so much more economically and demographically more dominant than the rest, <clears throat> I guess technologically as well. But if we look at Germany or whatever the Holy Roman Empire was, what would be the center, the true center of power? There, was, there were many competing centers of power. You could say Munich was very wealthy, but so was Berlin, but so was Hamburg, but so was Vienna. But also so was the Ruhr region. Uh, so was, um, I don't know, could be... A, there was Pomerania the competing for power. There were so many of them competing for power. Power. There wasn't one almighty uh, center of power like you were you had had around France with uh, Paris. There were many centers of power, which is why Germany still to this day is a federation. Even Austria, I believe, as well. Uh, secondly, it had much more rough terrain as compared to France. Uh, if we know this, uh, northern Germany, of course, is very flat, but when you get to central Germany, it becomes much more rugged, and when you get even more south, you get to the Alps, which is way more rugged. And, of course, ruling all over that uh, with many competing centers of power, because there was many population centers that were economically, sometimes equally uh, economically and uh, demographically dominant compared to the others, so there was just constant competition going on as well secondly when it comes to uh, river systems because because river systems really define nations all the french rivers flowed out throughout the countrysides into the atlantic ocean okay and with a little bit of engineering you can uh, put some canals in between them and you can have a proper riverine uh nationalized riverine system well with germany we know how Ger germany has m the most uh, navigable waterways in all of Europe, as a matter of fact. But a lot of them flowed through different places. As we know, the Rhine flows down, then through Vienna, and through, and through the Balkans, and then out into the Black Sea. While you would have the Oder River flowing uh, from, I guess, the Czech Republic down through, like, uh, uh, up into the Baltic Sea as well. Then you would have the Rhine River flowing all the way to the Al Atlantic through the, through uh, Dutch populated territories, uh, etc. You you get the point. But they had many rivers flowing through different loca locations, and usually the, their culture would match that of the culture of that river as well. They'd be they had more in common, even though they were Germans, they would have more in common with the people that they traded with more, because they had more cultural influence from those peoples. So they ended up acting differently and seeing themselves uh, politically different compared to the others and having different interests compared to the others. And the rugged terrain made it difficult for them to trade amongst each other as well. Uh, that was until rail and modern road networks were built. This is what Germans are known for. And after building the rail and um, road networks, they could finally unite as a federation at least. After such a long time. And when they finally united, the uh, Europe shook. Because a new great power arose in between them. Well, they didn't really have to worry about Germany back in the day. Because it was just a, a mess of many nations. And wasn't really that great of a threat to them. So, 
it really changed the balance of power in Europe. In Europe, sorry. Charles IV, the Golden Bull of 1356 saw major changes to the empire. Seven fixed electors were chosen who would decide the King of Germany, which had become a symbolic title of the elected but not yet coronated emperor. In 1440, with the election of Frederick III as emperor, this began three straight centuries of emperors from the same royal family, the House of Habsburg from Austria. During the rule of Maximilian I, the Habsburgs greatly expanded their influence through political marriages, acquiring Spain, Burgundy, Bohemia and Hungary. In 1494, war broke out on the Italian peninsula, primarily between the Habsburgs and France, over various territories and their respective inheritance, most notably Milan, Naples and Sicily. The war would continue on and off for more than 60 years and effectively ended imperial rule in Italy. In 1517, Martin Luther from Saxony published his 95 Theses, criticising the Roman Catholic Church and many of its practices in what became known as the Protestant Reformation. He really got ticked off because of the sale of indulgences, not only that, but because of many, many other reasons. Uh, but basically, uh, the Catholic Church was selling out in, um, indulgences. Basically, you buy that and do they rid you of your sins so you can get into heaven. <laughs> Basically, you're buying your way to heaven, ironically enough. It wasn't only that. It was also because he wanted people to read uh, the Bible in their language. Now, despite... Okay, l l l let me go off topic here for a bit for something very interesting. Despite what people say, people weren't really as illiterate back then as many people think. Because being literate back then didn't mean being able to read and write any specific language but a specific language latin so since most people didn't know latin it was just the curia uh and maybe the nobility that knew latin and that's about it so they were the literate educated types but yeah chances are people did know their language like in germany they knew german properly reading and writing it you didn't necessarily need to go to school to learn it the your parents could sit you down and they can just teach you all the letters and everything and how to read and write it properly because how else do you think people went into town markets and sold stuff you know they put up on bulletins and everything like i don't know selling 10 sheep or whatever in this location you would have to know how to read and write in order to live your life so people were a lot more literate back then. It's not that difficult to become literate back as mu as as many people would, would think. Uh, there was definitely more Ill illiteracy back then compared to now. I'm not saying that there were like all of them 99% literacy, but it was it was definitely not like 1% literacy like people thought back in the day. Just the 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 curia and the nobility were able to read and write. You know, a lot of other people were able to surprisingly enough so and this is also one of the reasons for the protestant reformation they wanted people to read the bible in their language not latin which very few people understood so profoundly changing the course of european history the holy roman empire became divided as many of the emperor's subjects adopted lutheranism creating religious tensions also that would last for more regions. than a century and to an extent even to this day it was around this difficult time that probably the most well-known holy roman emperor began his rule Charles V. Charles was already king of Spain, so Habsburg that power overbite. reached its peak with a vast array of territories both in and out of the empire. His rule was dominated by religious conflict, first starting with a war against various Lutheran princely estates known as the Schmalkaldic League, who were defeated by Charles and several Catholic princes. The Peace of Augsburg in 1555 gave rulers the right to choose the religion of their estate, Catholicism or Lutheranism based on the principle of cuius regio eius religio. Shortly afterwards, Charles V abdicated, splitting his inheritance between Spain and Austria. His son Philip II succeeded him in Spain, while his younger brother Ferdinand took over as emperor and archduke of Austria, starting the cadet branch of the House of Habsburg. Religious tensions continued as a rebellion started in the Spanish Netherlands, eventually leading to the establishment of the Dutch Republic, with seven of the 17 provinces seceding from Spain and the Empire. In After 1618, like year the war. Thirty Years' War started in Bohemia with the defenestration of Prague, which is just a fancy way of saying throwing someone out of a window. This began okay. the Bohemian Revolt, which spiralled into a continent-wide power struggle with all major European powers involved. The war ended with the Peace of Westphalia, a massive turning point in Yeah, so initially the Catholics had the upper hand, but the Swedish came down with uh, Gustav Adolf, uh, 
a very very much the person who is considered the father of modern military tactics uh, he introduced a lot of fancy new tactics from sweden and they actually managed to start fighting off uh, the catholics at the end of the day it ended up being ba basically a stalemate though the catholics did have upper the upper hand in certain regions such as uh you know the southern reaches which is why the southern germany is still very much catholic while northern germany is still very much um uh protestant that's not entirely true but mostly true uh, of course there's atheists in eastern germany guess why because of um sorry there was like a bug on my desk but i took care of that now so anyway i was saying uh, atheism eastern germany uh so the 30 years war was very brutal it was the third most brutal war in all of european history only being surpassed by the first and second world wars so up until now this was the most brutal war so brutal that as a matter of fact is if we take a look at uh, magdeburg for example uh before the war just before the war began magdeburg had when they did a population census had around twenty-five thousand people i believe which was not bad for its time definitely not bad but after the war finally ended 30 years later, there was around 600 people left in Magdeburg. Yeah, it was, it was pretty damn brutal. In the empire's history, many view this as the beginning of the end of the Holy Roman Empire. Dutch independence Peace was in finally Europe. officially recognized Everybody as well as the independence of Switzerland and the territories in northern Italy. The empire became even more decentralized and the Habsburgs' power began to decline. After the Peace of Westphalia, it becomes less relevant to talk about the history of the Holy Roman Empire as a whole, because what happened in the last 150 years of the Empire's existence relates more to the princely estates as individual entities in their own right. There were several very important and impactful wars throughout the late 17th and early 18th century, such as the Franco-Dutch War, the Nine Years' War, and the War of the Spanish Succession. There were always imperial princes on both sides of these conflicts. There was also the Long Turkish War, but this was more related to the Habsburgs and their possessions, given that much of the fighting was over Hungary, which was never part of the Empire. The final years of the Empire were dominated by the rivalry between Austria and Prussia, by far the two most dominant German powers. Austria had a succession crisis and the Habsburgs' three centuries of ruling the Empire came to a temporary end as Charles VII of Bavaria took over in 1745. The two powers clashed in the global conflict the Seven Years' War over Silesia as France and Austria unsuccessfully tried to curb the rising Prussian power. The Holy Roman Empire came to an end at the hands of Napoleon and revolutionary France. Austria was invaded in 17... And uh, this is basically many, what many would consider the beginning of the proper German nation after uh, Napoleon forced the creation of the confederation of the rhine uh, which brought all these uh, small princely states into one larger entity it was of course a french puppet state but it was still uh, a sign that german unity was possible and this is one of uh, this is how um uh future uh german politicians would end up uniting germany you know there was still prussia which ruled over the north but the southern areas are still not you know a part of what they would uh end up eventually becoming the uh the german empire but they united together because they basically hated the french together so the the protestant north ended up uniting with the catholic south which which is something no one would ever think would were to be possible up until then but by the time germany finally uh united uh the german mentality was very interesting to say the least so because all these different small german states had to um you know survive in such a situation so the rulers of those small princely nations would have to specialize in a certain field of economics so like one was specialized specifically for faceting the way you you know cut gems when i had to specify in silk you know because they didn't have much resources because they're so so such small areas with like barely ten thousand uh people all if they wanted to survive in that situation they had to become masters of certain crafts they couldn't become the masters of every craft because they're simply too small so they have to they had to focus on a certain craft so by the time germany was united 
they had towns and villages and cities that were masters of every craft you can think of. Like there's a, a Bosnian proverb for Germany. Like the Germans have a factory for everything, for creating from, from creating toothpicks to creating airplanes. So that just goes to show like by the time Germany united, they had everything they needed to become a successful state. So yeah, due in large thanks to the fact that all these small princely states had to you know, master their own craft in order to survive in such a situation. 1992 and renewed tensions in 1806 caused the last emperor, Francis II, to officially dissolve the empire, ending just over 1,000 years of existence. Though by then it was already going to dissolve. In making a video about the Holy Roman Empire, I am of course legally obligated to mention the Voltaire quote that it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. It's important to look at the context though. Voltaire lived throughout the 1700s where the empire was very much in its decline. He was also French and part of the Enlightenment movement, so he understandably took a somewhat negative view of the empire, viewing it as something of a relic of the past that had no place in modern society. So just how true is his statement? Well, although the term holy wasn't used until some 350 years after its creation, the holy element was absolutely essential for the empire to function. Its primary purpose was to provide a stable political order for all Christians. The emperor was supposed to be the, the guardian of the pope and defend his subjects against infidels. At the time, the thought of a secular power was inconceivable without any reference to a divine authority. In practice, of course, the various emperors and popes throughout the years had somewhat strained relations and the papacy became less and less involved in the empire's politics as the years went on. The term Holy Empire was first used in 1157 by the ruling Stauffer family, who tried to shift the emphasis from a monarch to a transpersonal Holy Empire that had already sanctified its divine mission, what and therefore the, the Empire did not need approval part. from the Pope. So in effect, the addition of the word Holy was actually an attempt to distance the Empire from the Papacy. Now Roman, that's a little bit more tricky. It may seem obvious to some that it was quite clearly not Roman, it was German. It's pretty clear that it was not a direct continuation of the Roman Empire, and even if it was, it wouldn't have revived the Western Roman Empire that actually had Rome as its capital, but rather it would have inherited its Romanness from the now Greek Eastern Roman Empire when the title of emperor was transferred from Constantinople back to Rome. The divide between the Latin West and the Greek East had been growing stronger over the preceding couple of centuries. Charlemagne was crowned in the year 800 with a somewhat tenuous link to the ancient Roman Empire. The prestige and authority commanded by the title Roman Emperor still held a lot of weight in the West and Charlemagne was recognised as Emperor, giving him immense power and status. People at the time really did view the Empire as a direct continuation from ancient Rome. Frankish rule over Italy didn't begin until 774 really. <laughs> and although the Franks had been Christianised and even somewhat Romanised, they didn't want to completely lose their own identity. As the well, the only thing that was really Roman about the Franks was that they started speaking a Romance language. Now, of course, French being probably the strangest of all the Romance languages, and it Italian, I guess, being the closest to the proper Latin language. Um, there was an interesting video of a guy like speaking Latin in Italy. Can't remember the name of the guy, but. It was a very interesting video. I've just searched up guy speaking Latin in Italy, and I'm pretty sure you'll see the video. But he, he was trying to speak Latin and try to figure out where to go, how to get to the Colosseum, and nobody understood a word he was saying. So by then, Latin lost all meaning, and the Romance languages developed into something completely different at that point. Uh, so yeah. the years went on, of course, it became much less Roman and much more German. After a few centuries, most emperors didn't even travel south of the Alps in their entire reign, except to be crowned by the Pope, and even that was discontinued after Charles V. The word empire doesn't really have a universally agreed upon definition, so it's not really possible to definitively say that it was or wasn't an empire. The idea of an emperor was that he was a monarch above that of a king, a sort of king of kings. Now, according to the divine mandate, the Roman Empire was to be the last and greatest empire, and there could only be one. The idea of an empire was singular and universal. This idea of singularity was deeply rooted in Christian thought at the time. Empires could not coexist. 
This was based on the theory of Translatio Imperi, the pretext used by the Pope to transfer authority from Constantinople. For most of its history, the Holy Roman Empire was referred to as simply the Empire, without any qualifiers, even in official documents. There were no other empires that were recognised in the West for most of its history. The Holy Roman Empire wasn't just an empire, it was THE Empire. Whether or not it could be classed as an empire by today's standards is debatable. The empire was quite decentralised and- Um, I would say kind of. Because for me, an empire doesn't have to necessarily have to be a massive thing like, you know, the Mongol or the British Empire was. But it, it's a, a lot of the time it, it is because of... It is like a multi, multi-ethnic kingdom in a sense. Where a kingdom would usually be uh, ruling over the same ethnicity or f for the most part, people of the s same ethnicity speaking a similar language with the same religion. An empire is where you have like uh, a dominant kingdom ruling over smaller kingdoms that are of different ethnicities and I guess maybe different religions as well. So the Holy Roman Empire kind of was that, even though it was mostly German, it also included Dutch and Italian people and, yeah, I guess Czech people as well. So in, in a sense, yeah, kind of an empire. And many of the regional princes commanded more power in their territory than the emperor did. The Holy Roman Empire was quite a unique mm -hmm. political entity. There's not really much else that is comparable. Thousands of... Statelets? That's a lot the Holy of Roman Empire used a complex system of feudalism to rule over its many territories. Local authority was delegated to vassals, who would normally in turn have their own vassals, creating a hierarchy of lords and vassals who swore allegiance to each other. Lords would protect their vassals and vassals would help and advise their lords and often pay them in cash, work or military assistance. Now vassals could either be immediate or mediate vassals. Immediate vassals were those that were immediately subordinate to the emperor, while immediate vassals had at least one overlord between themselves and the emperor. Immediate vassals of the emperor were referred to as imperial princes, and their territories were imperial estates. Imperial estates could pay a general tax to the empire to take part in the imperial diet, or the Reichstag. Those who did not pay the tax were not involved in decisions and had no vote. After 1489, the imperial estates were divided into three separate chambers or colleges, prince electors, imperial princes and imperial cities. There were also the imperial knights that were immediate vassals to the emperor but not represented. Counts and other nobles did not have a vote despite their immediacy status, although they were grouped into benches that had a collective vote. The prince electors were considered of a higher status than that of the other princes. The prince electors had the important task of electing the emperor. For most of the empire's history, there were seven prince electors, three ecclesiastical electors and four secular electors. The elective process quickly became corrupt and the imperial title mm. was pretty much Typical. just gained via bribery. In the year 1500, the empire was Kinda divided like into <laughs> six imperial circles. The circles were created to better organise the empire's defensive structures as well as to facilitate tax collection. In 1512, a further three were added, and Saxony was divided into two. There were also areas that were not part of any imperial I'm circle, lost, most notably <laughs> Bohemia, plus the Swiss and Italian parts of the empire. Now unfortunately, due to its complexity, it's impossible to represent the hierarchy of the Holy Roman Empire with a neat little pyramid with the emperor at the top. There was no single chain of command, and many of the internal hierarchies were interconnected. Imperial princes could have the same political status as each other, but with different prestige based on their noble title, such as king, duke, count, and so on. The most powerful imperial estate for centuries, Austria, created their own title, Archduke. Brandenburg Prussia became a kingdom in 1701, but for the first 71 years, kings were titled King in Prussia as opposed to King of Prussia, because Prussia fell outside of the territory of the empire and therefore did not require imperial authorization. Prussia was well on its way to becoming a great power in its own right, so really there was nothing the empire could do to stop them anyway. At the start of the video, I mentioned that the Holy Roman Empire was comprised of three core kingdoms. Germany, Italy, and Burgundy. Plus Bohemia, but that's Burgundy all felt So France. who was the king of Germany, and how did this title play into the hierarchy of the empire? 
Well, the King of Germany, Italy and Burgundy were three separate titles, but in practice for most of the empire's history, all three titles were held by the same person, who was usually the emperor as well. This wasn't always the case, and in the earlier years it was more complicated, but generally speaking, it was one person who held all titles. Bohemia was its own autonomous kingdom, being elevated from a duchy in 1198. The Bohemian crown lands came under Habsburg rule from the 15th century onwards, with some gaps, so many of the Bohemian kings were in fact emperor simultaneously. The Holy Roman Empire lasted for just over a thousand years and oversaw Central Europe's transformation from a feudal, agrarian and religiously uniform region to an increasingly centralised, urban and religiously divergent one. While the Holy Roman Empire was a significant power for a large part of its history, it didn't seem to be able to survive the changes in European society that eventually rendered it obsolete. I mean, it just became Germany, in a sense. Afterwards, the Holy but, yeah. Roman Empire was dissolved just over two centuries ago, but here's an interesting thought. What would the world look like if the Empire existed today? What okay, I have a strange opinion. I don't know why I think this, but for me, there is a modern Holy Roman Empire. I call it the European Union. In a sense, it's kind of like an expanded Holy Roman Empire, with the emperor being, I guess, in Brussels today, but has very little authority over its subjects. And everybody just kind of divides power among themselves, and everybody, uh, all the countries are electors of the place. We kind of made like a modern day Holy Roman Empire, didn't we? With the European Union. Hey, but. What if the Holy Roman Empire was somehow resurrected? Well, looking at that very question in his latest video is my. Okay, so um, I guess that's the end of this video, but um, yeah. So what do you think? Holy Roman Empire? Strangest political... What do you think is the strangest political entity ever? I'm still going to stick with Holy Roman Empire. But potentially Japan during its daimyo period was also strange, but I'll leave that uh, up to you and something to ponder about as well. So anyway, yeah. Thank you all for watching. As always, take care.